Nominative Destiny. After the minister told the wedding guests that the new bride came from Adam's rib, the mother of the groom, Mrs. Arden, praised the Lord for not delivering rain that evening. Thank you so much, she beamed. I present you with the new Mrs. Arden, but not before Miss Gordon, mother of Annabelle Dutton, attended a PTA meeting only to discover there was no name tag for her because Miss Dutton, new wife of Mr. Dutton, father of Annabelle Dutton, was assumed parent of Annabelle by the president of the PTA since Mrs. Dutton recently gave birth to Clarabelle Kenley Dutton, the president nearly apoplectic that a volunteer must have made a clerical error in failing to list Miss Gordon as Annabelle's mother, whose own mother, nay Potts, assumed the name Gordon as soon as she could to escape the potty jokes she and her father before her had suffered as a child when the elder Mr. Gordon was best friends with Tom Crowman, whose son changed his name to Paxton to secure a job in advertising, whose niece's close friend changed his name from John Davis to Max Greenstreet, who married a woman who gladly changed her last name with him, and when their computer servers went on the blink, they became telephone acquaintances with Bob from Bangladesh, Mary from Mumbai, Jane from Jalalabad, who went by no last names, similar to Zorro or Prince and Madonna and Beyonce and Ludacris and characters in Kafka, whose Joseph K is simply K for 300 pages, or a hunger artist with no name at all. So, so unlike Garcia Lorca or Garcia Marquez to honor both gene pools. And then there are Russian names where a simple marina in one short story can be variously referred to as Marisha, Marinochka, Marissa, or even Marishka, confusing the reader as to who waits in the parlor nervously stroking her dog, Masha. It's <laughs> nothing compared to patronymics and matronymics of those five fictional aristocratic families, the Bezukovs, the Bolkonskis, the Rostovs, the Kurigans, and the Drubetskoys, who lived in Moscow or St. Petersburg, which became Leningrad, then St. Petersburg again, unlike Hot Springs, New Mexico, permanently renamed Truth or Consequences, or T or C to the locals, after a 50s radio show host announced that he would air the program from the first city that renamed itself after the quiz show, and every May Day holds a beauty contest and a parade that features royalty such as Maria Martinez, the Chili Queen of Hatch, vaguely related to the Duchess of Alba, married to Luis Martinez de Arujo, whose daughter Maria Eugenia Brianda Temutella Cecilia Martinez de Arujo y Fitzjames Stewart frequently <laughs> scandalizes the society pages, himself son of the Duke of Sotomayor, whose second Duke of Alba in 1492 signed the capitulation of Granada. And let's not get into Chinese names, where every writer has a pseudonym, such as Zhang Er, the poet, who is also called Ming Sha Lu, the medical ethicist, or Nung de Guerre, exemplified by Carlos the Jackal, or Sid Vicious. And we all live through Patty, morphing into Tanya and back to Patty again, and Fat Dog, who is currently known as Fatty and Subcomandante Marcos, whose given name may be unknown, and Malcolm X, who converted to Malik El Shabazz, and all the Pope John Pauls, or should it be John's Paul? What about <laughs> George Foreman's five sons named George Jr., George III, George IV, George V, and George VI, and all those Louis with their gilded furniture, so averse to the great Jamaica King Cave, who writes books but didn't when she was Elaine Cynthia Richardson. Surely George Eliot thought more deeply than Marianne Evans. And 
George Sand could smoke cigars, whereas Aurore Dupin wore stays. And Vasnayik Manog Adoyan invented Arshal Gorky. After Samuel Langhorne Clemens adopted Mark Twain, and another American dream was born out of Norma Jean, and Moon Unit dropped the unit, and Chief Sitting Bull, or Jumping Badger, as a boy also nicknamed Slow, because he took extra time to do things. And was there really every Tom, Dick, and Harry ever? <laughs> Mother, may I? No, you may not go into the water, water, Mother says, as we sit on the lawn outside the public pool, all of us, a rare Sunday during May heat wave, eating bologna sandwiches, Mother her cottage cheese and tomatoes with wheat germ. Look what kind of people you find in public pools, she points, and besides, you could get polio. We kids can see perfectly through the low chain link fence, lying on our stomachs trying to get a suntan, which my brother says you cannot get until at least an hour after eating. <laughs> Sister says, ah, who needs to swim anyway? People pee in pools. I might let you take swimming lessons, Mother says, when your fragile respiratory system, your tonsillitis and your, she points to Sister, strep throat every three months disappears. Do you think I like taking you to the doctor all the time? You, she points to me, are so underweight, you skinny ass. What would you put in, into a bathing suit? Well, pipes up, brother, haven't you heard about the woman who surfs every day but doesn't know how to swim? You lie, I say, how do you know? I just do, he says, and if she wipes out, she reaches for the strap on the board. No big thing. An old lady with duds to her waist waddles by, and we follow her with our six eyes until she holds her nose with one hand, flings up her other, and jumps into the deep end of the pool. Did you see that, Sister screams? She must be crazy. Nah, she must have been an Esther Williams, Mother says, about 50 years ago. Who's Esther Williams, we three want to know, only Mother says, Sometime when an old Busby Berkeley movie comes on TV, you can see her. She was a bathing beauty with a big smile. Mother wanders over to talk to some people sitting on a picnic table a ways off. That lady was really fat, brother says. Yeah, sister chimes in. I'll bet she loves the deep end more than the shallow. Of course, brother says. Can't you see all those dumb little brats flashing around near the steps? I'll bet, I'll just bet that lady would never sink, even if you put your foot on her head. <laughs> Are you kidding, we sisters protest. How do you know that? Because fat floats. Learned that in science class, which you <laughs> may have been absent for. Don't be snide, sister says, taking off her pink sequined sunglasses and sticking out her tongue. You have a fat head. Yeah, well, your head is so tiny, it's amazing you could even talk, he says. <laughs> I know a lot more about people than you do, and did you know that Indians in the mountains of Peru can't swim? I learned that in school, you creep. Yeah, of course they can't swim. They wear everything they own at once, like ten skirts, and so if they did accidentally fall into a river, they'd float like a parachute. Who says parachutes float, Sister Snips? I say, stupid, listen, I don't care what Mother says. I'm boiling. Aren't you boiling? And Brother pops up and runs to the gate of the pool and turns to us and waves and jumps in right in the middle of the squealing kids. We hear a whistle, and then the lifeguard shouts into a yellow bullhorn, Boy in plaid shorts! Boy in plaid shorts! Out of the pool! Brother is goofing underwater and doesn't hear him or pretends not to, but Mother does, and we sisters know what hell they'll be. On the bus home, we whisper, ask Brother why the lifeguard pulled him out, and he says it was because he hadn't showered first, but we think that's a lie.